All right, I'm still putting in stuff for Facebook Live. This should do it though. Anybody that's watching, please just bear with us. We're connecting to Facebook Live, hopefully soon. It says you're live. It's not showing up on Facebook yet. No, it was on Facebook when I saw it, Russ. Oh, you can you see my out the window and everything? Well, hang on. Now I'm on Zoom. Hmm. Oh, uh, there we are. Okay. Camera here. All right. Hello, my friends. It's Ranger Russ from Meg's Point Nature Center. Uh, this took a little bit longer than we expected setting up this morning. Technological issues, but we are live with our very guest, very special guest speaker today, uh, Susan Robinson, who works at the Kellogg Environmental Center and Osborne Homestead Museum. I hope I got that right. Um, so this is the last of our Women Leaders in Conservation series. And I'm hoping that you enjoyed the last two. If you missed them, they do get put up onto our YouTube channel. So you can go there and view them, Meg's Point Nature Center YouTube channel. And then eventually they'll also be up on the website at megspointnaturecenter.org and you can view them in the virtual learning center. So this program, we also have lots of other programs coming up. We've got white-tailed deer and their relation to uh, ticks. We've got um, ducks that winter in Long Island Sound. That's next Saturday. So look at the calendar of events at megspointnaturecenter.org. You can watch them on Zoom or you can watch them on Facebook Live. So we can uh, connect those all together. Hopefully it'll go smoother than this morning. Uh, I think that's it for me. So I'm going to hand it off to uh, Susan. And Susan, do you want to do questions at the end or you want me to interrupt you as you go? Um. You can interrupt me as we go. I'll we can do that because I do have some questions for the audience. Okay, so because I'll be monitoring on Facebook because uh, we're live there, and all right. Okay. So why don't you get started, and I'll let you know when we've got some questions or answers to your questions. Okay. All right. So. Good morning, everyone. Um, thank you for um, coming to this special presentation. Um, my name is Susan Robinson. I am the museum curator at the Osborne Homestead Museum and environmental educator at the Kellogg Environmental Center in Derby. Um, we're located about 10 miles west of New Haven. And we are also within the property of Osborne Dale State Park. So Osborne Dale State Park was once the, was originally the land of the Pagusset Indians, and um, it was their hunting and fishing grounds. And later, um, in the 1600s, European colonists arrived. There were fur traders and merchants, 
And um, the river that you see below here, that's the Housatonic River. Um, Derby, that this, which um, meets at the um, confluence of the Housatonic and Naugatuck Rivers, was um, a huge trading port. It almost rivaled New Haven. And you see here in the picture, this is Osborndale State Park. And <laughs> um, it's about 350 acres. And where I work is here, this little site here, you see that small pond. And across from the pond, there's the museum and behind the museum, the Kellogg Environmental Center. So later on, um, this was also the site of the black governors of Derby. Quash Freeman and his son Roswell Freeman. So they own property here in the 1800s and they were one of many um, black governors throughout um, the state of Connecticut. Later on in 1870, you had the Osborne family who bought a small home, cute little farmhouse and about 10 acres. John White Osborne and his wife Susan bought the property and home for their son Wilbur Osborne and his wife Ellen. They had four children and one of them, the youngest, was Frances Osborne, who you see pictured here. She was born in 1876. She was the youngest of four, but the only child to survive into adulthood. So she lived in Derby all her life. And one of the questions we get is, well, what did her family do for a living? So here is a picture on the top right hand of um, John White Osborne, who was her grandfather. And he um, was a teacher. And later he and a partner got together and had a mer uh, general merchandise store, and which was Osborne and Cheeseman Company. And that's where they made their money. And they made their money in making hoop skirts and wires that were used in women's, women's clothing. So later, Wilbur Osborne, who is Francis' uh, uh, father and John White Osborne's son, he took over some of the family's businesses. So with Francis being an only child, she was surrounded by a lot of adults. She was very close to her father, Wilbur. And when she was a, a teenager, um, she injured her eye. She and her cousin were playing around and there was a needle. She took out a handkerchief and there was a little needle in the handkerchief. So she was, took out the handkerchief, she was twirling it around and unfortunately the needle punctured one of her eyes. And so she had a partial vision and her father encouraged her to um, not finish high school and to become her apprentice. So she became her father's apprentice and she developed a very, um, she was very savvy businesswoman, great financial sense and a great businesswoman. And also she became a great uh, philanthropist and civic leader. So when her father died about 1906, she was like 31 years old and financial advisors told her and her mom, sell everything, live off the savings, live off your investments. But Francis said, no, I can run my family's businesses. So this is 1906. This was a decade or more before women got the right to vote. So this was very uncommon for a woman to run her family's businesses. So she was pretty much ahead of her time, a strong-willed woman and a woman who knew her mind and knew what she wanted. So she took over one of the family's businesses, Union Fabric Company, and she became president of Union Fabric Company. And this building is still standing. It's now the site of um, Bad Sons Brewery and a consignment store, a secondhand store and a bookstore. But back in the day, it was a, a factory and they made covered wire and steel for skirts and bustles. So she became president of that company. She later became vice president of Connecticut Class Company, which was located in Bridgeport. And see, these are the corset springs and they gave support 
and um, elasticity to corsets. So she was in, very much involved in the wire manufacturing businesses for women's garments. And she was treasurer of F. Kelly Company, again, in the same building that housed the Union Fabric Company. And they made um, safety pins, sus um, suspender trimmings, and hose supporters for garments and other small metal goods. And she co-founded another business, um, Steels and Bus. At this time, she had her international um, <laughs> visions. So um, this was located in England. And Steels and Bus, again, another factory that was involved in making those small metal goods for garments. And these were are the busts that were in front of the corsets. So they gave the support to corsets. And she also was very much involved in Osborne Dale Farm. Now, when her father came back from the Civil War, he started um, breeding trotting horses. Her mom, Ellen, also bred um, cattle, red pole cattle. And so Frances had sort of like the boast of best lives. She was a cosmopolitan um, woman who visited New York City and Boston very often, but she also had a country life. She lived in um, Derby, but a part of Derby that was considered a rural area. So she was very much in tune with nature and she loved plants and animals. And um, when she got married in 1919, she and her husband Wilbur started breeding Holstein Frisian cattle. And in this picture, this is here, that's the Osborne Homestead Museum. We believe there is Frances, the lady of the house. And this is the New England Field Day um, photo from 1931. And this was sort of like the big E of Derby. So we have farmers, um, dairy breeders displaying um, their cattle. And so she was very much involved in the dairy industry. Here we have her husband. Here's Waldo Stewart Kellogg. He was an architect and he worked out of New Haven and in New York City. Um, they married in 1919. She was 43, Waldo was about 49. It was their first marriage for both of them um, and they had no children. And so they were equal partners in almost all sense of the word. And they were very interested in um, breeding these cattle, the Holstein Frisian cattle. And you can sort of say they were like their adopted children, the um, Holstein Frisian cattle. Um, Frances, she loved taking pictures with them. And sometimes for the holidays, she would send cars to family and friends, a picture of her with one of her prized bulls or cattle or cows, or just pictures of one of her prized cattle. And here, this is a picture of um, Frances with, um, Oh, what's his name? His name is Josh, and he won the first prize for a three-year-old um, in the New York New York State Fair. So he, you can see Josh. She is, you know, they were huge. He was huge, and um, she took a lot of great pride in her cattle. And she and her husband Waldo kind of like made Osborne Dale Dairy Farm second to none in New England. Um, they sold milk chocolate milk when she was a was since she was small a small girl they also um they bred trotting horses they had chickens and she would send um eggs to family and friends send flowers to family and friends and um oh i gotta tell you so some of her um their holstein frisian cattle broke records so she had the first cow um to produce over, oh goodness, it was five times the amount of milk that a cow usually produced in 1930. So that cow broke the 1930 record in milk production. And her um, cows also broke records in milk fat, in butter fat, you know, so they made very good um, ice cream. <laughs> And one of the um, most famous bulls 
that Francis bred was Ivan, Osborne Dale Ivanhoe. And he was so influential, this bull was so influential that some dairy publications like Holstein World um, dedicated several issues to the influence of Ivanhoe. And the story of how Ivanhoe was bred is very interesting and it kind of shows uh, Frances, her strong will, her sense of purpose and her persistence. So in this story, she had a farm manager, Fred Nichols and a cattle herd manager named um, Hans Jensen. So Frances wanted a certain bull to be mated with the queen cow of the Osborne Dale herd, but her farm manager didn't agree with the pairing. So Frances, she knew her own mind. She was like, this bull and this cow will be mated. So she told her herd manager, Hans, that when the cow was ready to let her know, and he told Frances, okay, these two are ready to be bred. So she walked to, into the barn and made sure that the mating occurred. And that was how Ivanhoe came to be. So if she had listened to her farm manager, we would have never had Osborne Dale Ivanhoe. So she stuck to her guns and said, this mating is gonna happen. <laughs> And because of Ivanhoe, and also due to artificial insemination, Frances is considered one of the top 10 of dairy breeders. And also one of Ivanhoe's daughters was the first cow to be sold for over a million dollars. So here she, these are all her titles in the dairy industry. So <laughs> she was a very busy woman, very influential and I like this picture of one, this is one of my favorite pictures of her. So here is Hans Jensen to the far left, who was her herd manager, Frances in the middle, and um, this is her friend, um, and they're on Osborne Dale Farm. So looking at this picture, what, and what does this tell you about how Frances was as a businesswoman, as a dairy breeder? You can let me know. Um, either in the chat or Russ can tell me what some of the comments are. There's a de little delay on Facebook, so we'll see if anybody has any comments. Most people are watching on Facebook. Oh, okay. Not seeing any comments on uh, on it, but okay. it looks to me like she's just gonna go right in there and uh, and do it herself. <laughs> Somebody says yeah. she's astute. Yeah, she was very hands on. She was very much involved in everything, every aspect of her business. And I and this and this is what this picture shows. Also, she was a very stylish woman. <laughs> Um, she used to, um, they would say she was very fashionable and she, um, when she walked into a room, you know, people, uh, you know, knew who she was. So she brought a lot of attention to herself. So she was very much, you know, hands-on when it came to running her businesses, um, very fashionable and also very proud of her business. And, you know, she, you see her friend there, obviously she was proud of what she did and how she ran her businesses um, by, you know, inviting her friend there to take a look at um, one of their um, Holsteins. But yeah, very hands-on, very much in, um, uh, fashionable and proud of the work that she did. A lot and of people are saying she, that she was very strong. Yeah, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And also her influence in the dairy industry continues today because I um, in her will, she left money to Yukon and the Yukon in stores has the Francis Eliza Osborne Kellogg Dairy Center. So, um, so yeah, so her influence continues today, not only with um, donating her land to a state park, but also with um, Yukon and their dairy center. And also she was very much involved in the community. Um, in civic engagement. And like I said, she was very much into, um, uh, you know, she, 
very much into nature and land conservation. And also her motto was always buy, never sell land. Um, her grandfather bought 10 acres in the home um, for her father and his son, Wilbur. By the time of Frances' death, she had acquired close to 400 acres of land. And so it's no surprise that she was involved in the Connecticut Forest and Park Association. She was their first woman vice president. And here's a picture with her on um, with the board members of CFPA. And, and we see a lot of pictures of this where she's the only woman, whether it's um, the dairy industry photos, going to some of the fairs and um, some of the business photos, but she was very much involved in land conservation. She was also an artist. Frances played violin. She took some schools at what is, um, took some classes at what is now um, Juilliard School of Music. And she also taught violin. And she started the Derby Choral Club. She had a lot of influence in um, the, um, the art world. Her uncle Henry Crabiel was a music critic for the New York Tribune. And Frances frequently visited New York City to stay with her uncle and hang out with her cousin Helen. They went to the symphony, garden shows, and also to the opera. And so she had a lot of connections in the music world. And the, she was the founder of Derby Choral Club. And she hired the, school, the dean of the School of Music at Yale University to be the director of the Derby Choral Club. She was also president of the Women's Club of Ansonia, Derby, and Shelton. She was their president for about two decades, 20, about 20 years. And she was, um, she invited opera singers, artists, performers, and also she invited Amelia Earhart. So um, Amelia Earhart spoke at the um, Derby, the Sterling Opera House in Derby, and hundreds of people came to that. Um, to that uh, that presentation, or this um, to hear Amelia Earhart speak and to sign her book. And Griffin Hospital, Francis was a trustee there at Griffin Hospital, which is still in operation today. And she was um, on the board of directors at Birmingham National Bank. Um, this building is still standing. It's in downtown Derby. It's now a restaurant. So she was very much involved in finances. And um, one story is, is that she would never, um, she always paid from the interest. She wouldn't um, pay from the principal with her bills. And she also paid her bills late because she didn't want to go uh, take money out of um, the principal. She wanted, she paid her bills from the interest. And she was president of the board at Derby Neck Library. Um, her father and several other partners founded Derby Neck Library. They thought that there should be a library in this section of Derby, the rural area of Derby that was known as Derby Neck. And her father um, actually uh, convinced Andrew Carnegie to donate close to $3,000 for books and for construction of Derby Neck Library. And later on, Francis became president of the board. It's still in operation today and, um, and it's still funded. They're still funded by um, Francis Trust. And it's a private nonprofit library. And that ends our my presentation. If you want more information, we do have a free audio guide. If you have, um, for, if you have a smartphone, um, computer, you can go on Easy Travel and um, download that app or go to their website and search for the Kellogg Estate and Historic Downtown Derby um, audio tour. So it's on Apple Store and some of the others, other um, uh, app stores like Google Play or Google Apps.
We had a question. Was was she instrumental in the uh, creation of the opera house in Derby? No, uh, -uh she wasn't involved in the creation of the opera house. Okay. And I have a question. She apparently started what you say five businesses. Um, she was on the board of like three or four different organizations when did she have time to be a farmer and all these other things that she did <laughs> that's a good question <laughs> well i think that she hired other people to kind of to do that she had the farm manager fred nichols she had a herd manager and um but yeah she had other other people who did those things but she was still involved in all of that and um, and maybe she had a lot of energy, I think. <laughs> <laughs> her uh, father used to nickname her Bobbin because she would be bouncing around um, in his factories like a little Bobbin on, um, that was a, a tool in one of his factories. When was uh, Osborne State Park established? Osborne oh, Oh yeah, thank you. I almost forgot about that. <laughs> so um, Francis, oh, and that's a good story too. So um, so like I said before, her model was always buy, never sell land. So in the 1950s, the city of Derby uh, came to Francis because they wanted to buy a plot of land on her property. Francis offered them some property that was you know, down the street from where she lived and, um, but the city of Derby didn't want that. They actually want what was uh, the property that was across the street from her home. So Frances, she had a lot of foresight. You know, she was very smart, very quick woman. She called up her lawyers and said, you know, in my will, I want to leave my property to the state of Connecticut. She was thinking if the city of Derby wasn't happy with the property that she offered them, it was likely they would use the um, um, eminent domain to take her property from her. So she called up her lawyers, said, you know, I want to leave my land to the state. And so since the state has higher authority than the city, the city of Derby wouldn't be able to use eminent domain to take her property. And so um, that left her property in perpetuity uh, as a conservation, as a state park for the benefit of everyone. So that was in 1956. Ni um, Frances died in 1956. She left her um, over 350 acres, which was her cattle pastures, mostly cattle pastures to the state of Connecticut. And, but the home was left to her housekeeper, Eva Little. And Eva Little was about the same age as um, Francis. So Eva Little was given lifetime tenancy of the home. And Eva Little lived uh, what is now the Osborne Homestead Museum until 1976. Eva Little was 101 years old. So someone was living there full time, you know, since Francis was born in 1876 till 1976. And so after Eva Little died in 1976, in the early 1980s, um, the museum opened to the public. So Osborne Dale State Park has been a park since, tonight, since 1956. And how about the Kellogg Environmental Center? Oh, yes. Oh, thank you for mentioning that too. <laughs> So the Kellogg, so Frances left money in her will for the construction of an education center. And the Kellogg Environmental Center was con finally constructed and fully staffed in 1985. Let's see, we have another question. Uh, what is there to do in the park, trails, museum, etc.? So there's, um, let me bring up this map again. So there's uh, fishing, there's um, hiking trails, 
there's, you know, we also have, um, there's uh, dog walkers, the museum and the Kellogg Environmental Center due to COVID-19 and for safety precautions, uh, it is closed, temporarily closed. But um, when we get to the point where we can um, um, open up again and, um, and open up safely, uh, we have public programs, we do teacher workshops, the museum also um, their tours and um, also public programs and workshops at the museum. Uh, we also have a garden, Francis, um, about 1911, there was a, a constructed a nice um, a formal um, English garden. And so people can walk the grounds and enjoy the scenery and, all, and the beautiful flowers in the gardens. It's peak in, the, um, in late May, early June. So that's another thing that they can do there. So yeah, so picnicking, there's also in Osborne Dale State Park, you can um, field sports, they have pavilions, people have uh, birthday parties and other celebrations um, that they can um, do outdoors. I did a visit over there early on uh, last spring and there were some beavers that had blocked up uh, your pond a little bit, it was a little bit high. Is that uh -huh. still the case? No, no, it's not, yeah, it's not, it's not like that. Um, the last time I, yeah, the, yeah, so, cause I think the water was coming, was it reaching the road or crossing over to the road? It was close, yeah. Okay, yeah, it's not like that anymore. I think it subsided. Uh, we have another question. Why is it called the Kellogg Environmental Center? And can you take classes there? Is there a membership fee? And is there a mailing list? Um, so it's called Kellogg because um, I think that's probably that was Frances, her married name, Frances Osborne Kellogg. And um, um, there's no membership free, no membership fee. It is free to walk the grounds to, there's no fee for going into the museum or um, um, there's no fee to go into the Kellogg Environmental Center when we reopen safely to the public. But, um, but yeah, there's no membership fee. It is free. You don't have to pay anything. And then we do have a listserv that you can join. If you go on our website, uh, www.ct.gov um, forward slash Kellogg. You can join the Kellogg Listserv. All right, I'm not seeing any other, well, let me check. Nope, not in chat. So I'm not seeing any other questions. So the park itself is about, what do you say, 350 plus acres? Yes, uh-huh. It is a, it's a beautiful spot right near the river there too. Mm -hmm. Another question, uh, was there any relation to the cereal Kellogg's? Oh, no. Um, Waldo Stewart Kellogg, he's not related to the Kellogg family that made the cereal. He All was right. an architect and he was the supervisor of the construction of the Veterans Hospital in, uh, West, in West Haven. So, um, so he was an architect, not involved in Kellogg cereal and no relation to the family. <laughs> we get that one a lot. So again, this this series has been talking about women that that were really forward thinking in in conservation, and obviously, she was forward thinking as a businesswoman, farmer, musician, philanthropist. It's like she had her hand in in everything in her community. It seems like, but yeah. the the land that she set aside is is the. Uh, like you said earlier, it is a real jewel. And for people that have not visited, um, 
obviously you can't go into the center right now, but the, the property there is absolutely beautiful. And you can, as you walk through, you can just imagine it being open fields with all of her champion cows out there and everything. It's really quite the place. All right, do we have any other questions? I see some comments. What happened to the animals? Oh, that's a good question. So um, when Francis, or are they talking about the cattle? I'm presuming they're talking about her um, cattle herd. Yeah, I'm assuming that as well. Okay, all right. So when Francis died, um, there was an auction. So her entire herd was sold to um, a lawyer and owner of Hilltop Farm. His name was Charles Stroh. And um, he auctioned off the cattle the following year in 1957, a year after um, Francis' death. So it was a huge event, um, that auction, and people came from all over the world, um, Alaska, Latin America, and um, so her cattle were auctioned off. They were sold to another um, farmer, Charles Stroh, and he later had an auction and sold off her cattle herd. It was, she had over a hundred, it might've been, I wanna say 120 um, uh, cattle that were sold. And one last question, is there a path that goes down to the river? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't think there is because the road yeah, I don't, there's not. Well, actually, if you go, if you see my, if you go behind the Kellogg Environmental Center and there is a little road here and this area here that is right by the river, that's um, the recreation camp. And that was actually, um, the land was formerly um, Francis, but she just sold it to um, a, a businessman and he um, created a recreation camp for uh, adults and children to learn how to swim. So there is a path, um, but it's now, some of it's paved over, but you have to cross the street that leads you directly to um, the river. All right, I'm not seeing any other questions. So we can wrap it up. Um, I really want to thank you, Susan. This was a, a great presentation, and I learned, I learned that um, that Francis had more energy than uh, most people today. <laughs> so she's a very impressive uh, woman with her energy and her and her diverse interests. I want to thank everyone for uh, for tuning into this uh, series. And again, you can see the, um, the videos from this series on our YouTube channel and on our website. Visit the Virtual Learning Center at megspointnaturecenter.org and watch uh, the videos about the other women involved. Um, again, make sure you check the calendar of events. We've got many, many programs coming up uh, Saturdays. I want to give a shout out to our volunteers, particularly Lori uh, Shaw for booking so many great lectures. We've got lots of wildlife lectures coming up through February. And then we're gonna be looking at some plant lectures in March. And now I think we're looking at environmental topics for April. So please stay tuned and you can watch all of those on either on Zoom or on Facebook Live. So if there's Nothing else. I'm seeing lots and lots of thank yous. So we are going to set, sign off. Thank you again, Susan. Great presentation. Well, thank you for having me. All right, we are going to sign off now. I hope to see all of you this coming Tuesday at 11 for my Facebook Live presentation. Until then, this is Ranger Russ signing off.